Amen. John chapter 8, verses 31 and verse 32. There it is in front of you if you do not have a Bible today. And the word of the Lord from the King James text reads, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Hallelujah. Praise God. If you'll bow your heads with me one more moment. Father, once again, God, we come before you. We ask God at this moment that you would Touch the minister of God. Touch my body, my mind, my spirit, my tongue. Lord, you placed a word of encouragement, a word of exhortation upon my heart for the people of God at this time. And it is always my desire to deliver that which you have given me in a fashion that will bring glory and honor to your name, that will bring encouragement and enlightenment inspiration to the hearing and the hearts of God's people. I need your help, Lord. We all need your help today. Help us not only to speak the truth, but help us as well to hear it, to receive it, to digest it, and to put it to good use in our lives. We ask it all today in that blessed, sacred, wonderful name, Jesus. Amen. Praise God and amen. You may be seated today. Praise God. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Many today preach a gospel of works, saying that our salvation depends upon that which we do, that which we say, and that which we abstain from. But the Lord Jesus Christ made it clear that salvation and liberty were found in only one thing, and that thing today is the truth. Truth is right knowledge. In other words, you can know a lot of things just because you think you know something doesn't mean you got the truth. We got people in our country today who listen to certain sources who tell them all kinds of uh, conspiracy theories, you know, Bill and Hillary Clinton have had millions of people murdered. All they had to do was speak the word and people were murdered. And Hillary Clinton was involved in a child molestation ring, you know, a child slavery ring. And it was run out of the basement of a pizza parlor that has no basement. <laughs> but you know how many people believe that foolishness? You know why? Because they trust the source. They trust the people who are speaking. They don't trust the facts. It makes me laugh how many times I, I hear people on the right side of the political spectrum talking about, you know, investigating Hillary's emails and investigating this and investigating that. And they've got all kinds of conspiracy theories. Forget the fact that there have been investigations. Forget the fact that the investigations turned up no proof of anything substantial or any wrongdoing or what have you. Forget all that. No, I know the truth, bless God, because Fox News told me. Telling you, a lot of people go to church today, Martin, and they believe what they're told because they think that the person talking is supposed to be an expert. That's right. But you know, it's funny. I wonder how many of us, and it includes me, and I grew up in a fundamentalist church, folks. I wonder how many in this room today feel freer and more liberated and less bound today in your walk with God than you did growing up as a kid in church. How many? I wonder. Amen. Why is that? I'll tell you why. Because when you preach the truth, it is liberating. 
When you preach the truth, it breaks the bondage. It breaks the chains. When you preach the truth, it is not weighty. It is not binding. But rather, it sets you free. Telling you today, Christianity is not about rules and regulations. It's not about legislation. It's not about laws and mandates and edicts and standards. The Christianity today is about knowing something. Jesus said that our liberty rests in our knowledge. Am I telling the truth today? What do you know? You ever had somebody... Some of us that are a little bit older, maybe, probably remember there was a time when it was rather popular. You'd see somebody on the street that you knew, and they'd say, hey, what do you know? Right? We used to greet people like that. Now, you know, most of the time today we say, how you doing, or how are you? But it was kind of popular at one time for folks to say, what do you know? Or what's up that's good? Or what's going on? How are things going? You know what I'm talking about? That was one of our standard greetings. What do you know? Well, I'm here to ask you today. What do you know? Because what you know is going to determine whether or not you're free in Christ. Not what you do. Not how you do it. Not who you do it with. Not what you say. Not where you say it. But what you know. Hallelujah. Because Jesus said, you shall know the truth. And the truth will make you free. Hallelujah. So, Johnny, it's not about what I'm doing. It's about what I'm knowing. Hallelujah. Do you know the truth today? A lot of people, they say, well, I know God. I'm a Christian. I know what the Bible says. No, you know of God. You call yourself a Christian, and you know what somebody's told you the Bible says. Hello now. There's a world of difference between being able to say I'm a Christian, I know God, and I know what the Bible says. And saying, nobody wants to admit, well, I know about God, I've heard of God, I have some concept of God, and, and I know what I've been told the Bible says. I remember years ago, my grandmother had read an article about a group that was designed for people coming out of fundamentalism. It was actually an ex-fundamentalist Christian support group that they had nationwide. They had groups meeting all over the country. And my grandmother, of course, being a good Assemblies of God woman, read, you know, saw this headline and she said, oh my, this is terrible. This is awful. How could anybody say such a thing? She said, but then I read the article. She said, you know what? I hate to admit it. She said, but I could actually see a lot of their point said, I could actually give them a lot of what they were saying. I could actually acknowledge that a lot of what they were saying, Johnny, was true. She said, especially when one of her daughters, an aunt of mine, had left the Assemblies of God and was going to a Baptist church. She said, I noticed that everything they talked about in this article applied to that particular aunt who was going to a Baptist church. She said, now Faith was raised in, that's her name, Faith. It, it's, it's an oxymoron, but we won't go any further than by saying that. Faith was raised in a Pentecostal church where your authority and your final word always came from the scriptures. She said, all of a sudden, Faith was going to this Baptist church, and every time you talked to her about something, she would say, my pastor says this, my pastor says that, my pastor says this, my pastor says that. And this ex-fundamentalist uh, group in this article, they were saying that this is one of the trademarks of fundamentalism where it's all about what your pastor says and you constantly that fundamentalists oftentimes will constantly refer to what their pastor says I remember one time I was pastor in my very 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 first church I was 19 years old I was at Zoe's Pizza Palace in Seymour Connecticut my favorite place in the entire universe you ain't never ate pizza till you ate pizza there, I'm telling you right now. 
Everybody I've ever taken there to have pizza, everybody has become addicted. Right, Tommy? Mm -hmm. I mean, you ain't never had pizza until you've eaten Zoe's Greek pizza. It's incredible. Well, I was at Zoe's when I pastored my first church. Uh, it was in that community, so I used to go to Zoe's. I grew up on this pizza. You know, I used to go there all the time. And I was there one day, and, and somehow or another, I struck up a conversation with a young man and his wife who were standing there in line. And we began to talk, and turns out that they were Baptist folks. And I mentioned that I pastored a church of God in the community, which was a Pentecostal church. Well, immediately this young man thought he was emboldened to debate with me about Pentecostal doctrine and how wrong talking in tongues was and all this sort of thing. Uh, trust me, you don't want to go there with me. Just take my word for it. You don't want to go there with me. I don't believe what I believe because somebody told me. I believe what I believe because I've searched the word of God. I know what the book says. So, honey, you ain't gonna, you're, you're going to have a hard time arguing with this old boy. So he began to try to debate with me. And I'd say to him, well, then, my friend, how come in this passage and in this passage and in this passage and in this passage, it says that every time these people received the gift of the Holy Ghost, they spoke with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave them the utterance. Why did Jesus say in Mark 16, and these signs shall follow them, not may follow, shall follow them that believe in my name they shall cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues. Well, my pastor says that this passage means this. My pastor said, I said, I'll tell you what. When you finally decide you want to put your confidence in the word of God instead of your pastor, then come talk to me. Because until then, we have nothing to talk about. Hello now. Listen, we're not even on the same page. You know why we can't get a lot of people in the world today to understand affirming theology? You know why we can't get a lot of people in the church world today to understand the truth about grace? Because they've got more confidence in what their pastor says than what scripture says. Amen. My mother's yeah. former husband, she was married to a fellow uh, when I began the church here in Dallas. He was Southern Baptist. <laughs> yeah, I know. Bless his heart. <laughs> we used to send him, I used to send him tapes when I was in New York City, you know, pastoring my affirming work in New York. I used to send mom tapes of our services up in New York. And mom would put them in the cassette player and she'd listen to them and she loved them. And one day her husband came in to my mother and said to her, now I know this because she told me, I'm not just, this isn't mind reading, this is what my mom told me. She said, Scott looked at her and said, you have a wonderful son. And my mother was kind of taken aback. She was surprised. He'd been listening. You see, the fact is, if you listen to what I'm saying, you can't argue with it because it's the truth. When I came to Dallas and started our church, guess who was sitting beside my mother in the very first church service? Her husband. He come with her regularly. He told me one day, he literally told me one day with his own mouth, he said, Chuck, I honestly believe that you preach the gospel of Jesus Christ the way it was meant to be preached from the get-go. I believe that what you're preaching is right on the money. We used to have a fellow at the nursing home. See, I have a problem. I, I, I'm very plain spoken, as you all know, and I tend to be, you know, kind of to the point about a lot of things. Well, when I'm in the nursing home, I don't suddenly become, you know, Mr. Soft and Squishy. I'm still me to the <laughs> God bless the people that have to listen to me, right? Well, one day there was a retired Church of God in Christ preacher who was there. He was a black man, a wonderful old fella in his 80s. What was his name, Booby? Do you remember? I can't think of his name off the top of my head. But he was a retired Church of God in Christ preacher. And one day after the service I went, I shook his hand, and he kind of pulled me in to him a little closer. He said, you know what we used to call preachers like you? 
And I'm thinking, oh dear Lord, I can only imagine. <laughs> what, lip-wristed evangelists? You know, pink and sassy preachers? I don't know where Jesus I, I didn't know what his, what his, uh, his words were going to be. He said, we used to say preachers like you preach the bare-naked truth. He said, brother, you just preach the bare-naked truth. He said, you don't dress it up. You don't try to make it look frilly or fancy. You just tell it like it is. This was an old retired church God in Christ preacher. I had a, I don't know if I should say, I better not say it too plainly because it will cause trouble for somebody, and I don't want to cause trouble for people. I had a preacher from the most conservative Pentecostal denomination on this planet called me several years back. I think he said he was in West Virginia. I always get confused. He either said he was from Virginia or West Virginia, one of those states. I'll never forget at least as long as I live. Call me on the phone. And he said, is this Brother Morrow? I said, yes, sir. He said, uh, I'm so-and-so, and I pastor such-and-such such Pentecostal church over here and such and, and immediately, my guard went up. Immediately, I felt myself drawing in. It's like, okay, what kind of garbage am I going to have thrown at me now? Because I'm used to having garbage thrown at me. So all of a sudden, boy, I had my net ready so I could catch the tomatoes and the cucumbers and the cabbage as it started flying my way. And I said, yes, sir. He said, I just wanted to call and tell you my wife and I have been listening. See, back then we didn't have our sermons in video online. We only had the audio online through our website. He said, my wife and I have been listening to your sermons now for several months. And I wanted to call and tell you. And again, I start to get a little nervous. What am I going to hear? I wanted to call and tell you. My wife said to me, that man could not have the anointing of the Holy Ghost that he has if he were preaching lies. And that man has an anointing from the Holy Ghost. He said, I wanted to let you know that we support you 100%. We're behind you 100%. I thought I was going to fall off my chair. One of the most legalistic, one of the most conservative Pentecostal denominations in the world. And this man's part of that denomination. And he said, we support you 100%. We had a pastor right here in Garland, Texas. He since has retired and he and his wife moved away. And I'm sad for that. We were able to go to his church and fellowship every once in a while. We were actually able to have a little bit of fellowship. It was wonderful. I enjoyed it. I appreciate it. I knew better than to wear it out because, you know, I don't want to start controversy in anybody else's church. That's not what God's called us to do, folks. I don't want to start a controversy anywhere. But you know what? Every time I'd come to that church, Tommy and I'd go that he'd give me a hug. And every single time he'd say in my ear, we appreciate the work you're doing. Every single time. You see, when people hear the truth of God, it is liberating. When you hear the truth of God, it don't sound like falsehood. It don't sound like a lie. Am I telling the truth? When you hear the truth of God, Martin, immediately, it, it just rings in your ear, and you just hear this little vibration that says, that's the truth. <laughs> that's the truth. Hallelujah. It just touches your spirit and lets you know, that's the truth. When I get up and preach, if grace doesn't apply to everybody, it don't work for nobody, that's the truth. When I get up and say God doesn't love the heterosexual and hate the homosexual, he loves everybody the same, he loves us all just alike, that is the truth. When I say that every child of God in the pew of every church in America and around the world today has sin in their life, whether they like it or not, that is the truth. When I say that God, by His grace, saves us and calls us saved and calls us born again and calls us holy and calls us righteous 
in spite of ourselves, that is the truth. Amen. And when I say the only thing going to get you into heaven is faith in God and in the gospel of Jesus Christ, that is the truth. Too bad we've got so many who have tried to create all kinds of other rules and regulations. Yeah. Too bad we got so many who have tried to make up, Martin, all kinds of other requirements for heaven. Yep. Mm -hmm. No, when you hear the truth, it's liberating. All of a sudden, I mean to tell you, I'm going to tell you, I preached a lot of years before I came out and started doing affirming ministry. I fought God tooth and toenail. <laughs> I did. I fought him tooth and toenail. I told him he didn't know what he was talking about, but he wouldn't listen to me. I tried to tell him, Lord, you keep trying to tell me that you understand LGBT people, and I know better than that. After all, every pastor I ever grew up with told me you didn't. Every denomination that I'm familiar with in America told me you didn't told me they were nothing but a bunch of smut-loving, pornography-watching, uh, you know, uh, porno-addicted, uh, drug-taking, drunken, uh, orgy-loving perverts. That's all they were. And on top of that, on weekends, they molested children just for kicks. You know, that's what I've always been told. So, Lord, obviously, you don't know what you're talking about. I'm going to tell you, God has a way of getting your attention. God has a way, especially if you're a preacher and you're, you're going to try to represent him. I'm going to tell you, let me tell you something. Any preacher that preaches anything but the truth, I guarantee you they are preaching what they're preaching and they know they're wrong. Because God will not let anybody stand up and preach without them having a knowledge of the truth. Now let me tell you, just because you know the truth don't mean you'll preach the truth. Right. Mm -hmm. A lot of preachers. I, I told you about a lady one time I met who looked like she was Pentecostal holiness. And when I asked her where she went to church, she said, well, I'm uh, a Wesleyan Methodist. And I thought, Wesleyan Methodist? And she got her hair all up on her head and she got long dresses and long sleeves. I thought, my Lord, uh, so, what, how come she looked Pentecostal then? And she said, may I ask you why yes? And I said, well, to be honest with you, I assume maybe you were Pentecostal because you look Pentecostal. Said, Pentecostal? Oh, that tongue-talking stuff? Oh, no, sir, that scares me to death. That's what she said. That scares me to death. She said, no, Wesley and Methodists believe in the same standards. They believe in the same rules and regulations as the holiness Pentecostals do. So we look the same. But they don't have the Holy Ghost. They don't preach the baptism of the Holy Ghost. So they looked the part. Not everybody knows the truth is willing to preach the truth. There's a lot of preachers who know the truth, but by God, they're not about to preach it because if they did, they'd empty their churches. Mm -hmm. I had a Spanish Pentecostal, Trinitarian Pentecostal minister and his wife who became very friendly with uh, Jason and I when we were in New York City. When I first... When I first was starting to come back into ministry and all, and I told you before, when I came back to the church, I had no intention of preaching a sermon a day in my life. Because I felt like after some of the things I'd done and some of the places I'd been, I said, Lord, I hadn't got no right in the world to be standing in a pulpit. I've done some dirty, filthy, horrible things. Now, some of y'all are maybe a little more lily white than I am. Some of y'all, maybe you come to the foot of the cross with less baggage than I did. But I'm telling you, I had bags and bags and bags. I think it took two or three trains to get all my stuff loaded up. And I said, Lord, I, I was like the prodigal son, you know, coming home saying, I, I can be a servant, but I can't be a son. Because, man, have I done some raunchy things. Have I, have I failed you miserably? So we, I, I was going to start a parachurch ministry, meaning 
Jason and I opened a learning center, uh, an apostolic learning center in Brooklyn, New York. We got us a storefront, just like our little center over here. We had books for sale. We had a library area where people could come in and borrow books and videos and what have you. And they also, we had a beautiful, uh, this is before the internet. Uh, we had a beautiful reference library area and ministers or whoever wanted to could come in. They could use the wonderful resources we had. We we had every commentary you can name of. If you've ever heard of the pulpit commentary, that is probably one of the most uh, uh, popular commentaries in all of Christendom. It is extremely expensive because it's like 50 volumes. And it literally is a commentary on the Bible from Genesis all the way through Revelation. Every word, every, you know, everything. It, it, it breaks it all down for you. Uh, we had the pulpit commentary available. We had a copy machine where if a preacher come in and he wanted to make notes, you know, for his sermon or he wanted to copy a page of a commentary, he could put it on there, drop a nickel and make himself a copy. Had a wonderful learning center going. I said, Lord, I can do this. And this way we can minister to people and help them to, to know apostolic truth. Everything we sold that was doctrinal in nature was apostolic. We did not have one drop of Trinitarian uh, material in that store that was doctrinal. Now, if a Trinitarian minister wrote a book on marriage or wrote a book on, you know, children or something, yeah, we might have that. But we would not have anything that represented any doctrine outside of the apostolic faith. Well, of course I'm going to do that because that's what I believe and I'm not about to, I'm not about to help promote something I don't believe. We also were planning on bringing in material that was affirming in nature so we can help people who are LGBT, you know. Well, I didn't realize right then how hard that was going to be to find. At the time, trying to find affirming material was just about impossible. So I began to write literally dozens of Bible studies and articles that dealt with affirming issues and I printed them up in little booklets and we used to give them out to people because that was that's the only resource I knew that we had. But what I didn't expect, Brother Johnny, was that preachers had come into our little bookstore and they'd meet me and they'd talk to me and say, you're a preacher, aren't you? Well, I can't say no because I know God called me to preach. So I'd say, well, yes, you know. But I'm not preaching right now. Well, why don't you come preach for me on Sunday? So I went and I preached for them on Sunday. Why? Because when God called me to preach, he said, wherever the door's open, I want you to go. If that door opens, you go. And I knew that even though I was coming back to the Lord, I knew, Johnny, that I couldn't break the rules. You know, God, God didn't mean it then and not mean it now. That's right. So I said, all right. So I go into their church. I preach. Guess what happened? I mean, the Holy Ghost broke out. We had church all over the place. I'm talking in Connecticut. I'm talking in New York City. I'm talking in uh, all five boroughs in New York. I'm talking about uh, New Jersey. We begin to have Holy Ghost outbreaks. I said, dear God, it's like I never left church for a minute. It's as if I never was out of church. And the Holy Ghost spoke to me and said, well, see, now you're finally learning the lesson. I said, what lesson is that, Lord? He said, it ain't about you. It's about me. <laughs> See, you're not out there preaching you. You're out there preaching me. As long as you're preaching me, I'm going to do what I do. <laughs> as long as you preach the truth, I'm going to do what I do. As long as you preach what you know, I'm going to do what I do. And guess what? It didn't matter that I'd backslid and done all kind of dirty, filthy, horrible things. None of that mattered. As long as I preached the truth, God was still moving. And wonderful things were happening. And I finally realized, Lisa... That my humanity didn't get in God's way, never did, never could. Why do you think so many people come to the Lord? Why do you think so many people receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost under the ministry of Jimmy Swaggart when all the while he was having flames with these hookers every once in a while? I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not, you know, I'm just saying it. Why do you think that happened? You know why? Because Jimmy Swagger wasn't preaching Jimmy Swagger. Jimmy Swagger was preaching Jesus. And as long as he told the truth, God was going to honor his truth. Do you hear what I'm telling you? You see, our humanity does not get in God's way. It doesn't get in God's way when you're in the pulpit. And i got news for you today, children. It don't get in God's way when you're in the pew. 
Your humanity does not get in God's way. God is not offended by our humanity, as I like to say. He is offended only by unbelief. Knowing the truth of God that liberates and sets free is not rooted in knowing facts and figures, but rather it is in knowing the Lord Jesus Christ himself. In John 14 and verse 6, the Lord said, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So if Jesus is the truth, Martin, and if he said you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free, then what do you need to know? You need to know Jesus. Hallelujah. But you need to know the real Jesus. Not the Jesus that the Mormons preach, the brother of Lucifer, the son of Elohim, who is the, you know, one of many gods in the universe, <laughs> overseeing one of billions of worlds, because in reality there are billions of gods out there, don't you know? And every god has his own planet. And that god, literally, this is what the Mormons teach folks, and when they come knocking at your door, don't give them three minutes of your time, because they're not going to tell you all this right at the front door. No, they'll wait till they got the hook in your mouth and they get you into their little group. And then all of a sudden they're telling you that Jesus and Lucifer are brothers. And all of a sudden they're telling you there's a God over each planet that has people. And that God has sex celestially with his wife, literally. And they create spiritual babies. And those spiritual babies float around in outer space waiting for you on earth to have babies. And when you have a baby, one of those spiritual babies now has a home. And that spiritual baby comes down from heaven and it occupies that body. And, and that's why Mormons have so many children. Because they literally are taught that the more children they have, the more bodies they're giving to these spiritual babies that are up there that their God has created that is waking on a body. Do you hear? I, it, it sounds like I'm making it up because it's so crazy, don't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a fact. You can't just believe in a Jesus. You can't just believe in Jesus the way the Mormons represent him. You can't believe in Jesus the way that the Jehovah's Witnesses represent him. Well, he was just an angel that God turned into a man. And he was nothing more than a man. Why, he was human, 100% human. There was nothing about him divine. And they've got explanations for why the Bible refers to him as God. Because after all, didn't the, uh, doesn't the Bible say that there are those things that we call gods? So in other words, you know, he was just a god in the sense that we called him a god. You know, the same way you'd call an idol a god. You know, it's just, it's just a matter of human reference. But there's nothing divine about him. Well, got news for you. I was doing some research. I, I'm constantly researching something. I like research. I, I have fun learning stuff. And I was looking into the Jewish uh, belief concerning, uh, you know, I've, I've taught you and I've told you, the Bible says that no man can die for another man's sin. No person, no human being can pay for another man's sin. And I was doing some research and this, this Jewish author, was a, a rabbi, was writing about how this is why we don't believe that Jesus was the Messiah because the God taught us, Jehovah God taught us, that no human being can die for another human being's sin. So if that be true, then Jesus can't possibly be the Messiah. His death cannot possibly have anything to do with human being salvation because no human being can die for another human being's sin. And I sat there and I'm reading this and I thought, right, you're right. You're absolutely right. That is exactly what the Old Testament taught. You ain't lying one bit. Every word you're speaking is truth. The only problem I have with you is you don't know who Jesus is. See, Tommy, that's where the Jehovah's mess up. If he were only a man, according to the teaching of Scripture, his death would have meant nothing. Absolutely nothing. Because according to Old Testament and New Testament scripture, 
Every individual must answer for themselves. And nobody can pay for your sins on your behalf. It's impossible. But the word of God said that Jesus came. Remember that passage I love to quote? What the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. God sending his own son in the likeness, in the likeness of sinful flesh. Condemned sin in the flesh. You see, what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary, it wasn't just about uh, paying for your sin or paying for your transgression. No, 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 no. What Jesus did is he literally destroyed the entire concept of sin. The only thing that separated us from God was sin. Jesus came and the Bible said he destroyed sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. So what Jesus did was he took a law that we all had broken and he smashed the law to pieces. Mm -hmm. Now if the law is smashed to pieces, then it no longer applies. But who does it no longer apply to? It, it no longer applies to those who have faith and believe that he smashed the law into pieces. Do you follow what I'm saying? Doesn't apply to everybody because if you don't believe he did it, then you don't benefit from what he did. But are you following what I'm saying? Yep. So this man didn't understand, honey, it wasn't a man who went to the cross. It was God who became a man. It was God who put on sinful flesh who went to the cross. And because of who he was, his death meant a lot. Amen. Hallelujah. And the Bible said that the... Yeah, I'm about to fall. The Bible said that the princes of this world did not know who Jesus was because had they known, it says they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. They would not have crucified him if they knew who he was because they didn't know we don't want to mess with God. <laughs> the last thing in the world I want to do is crucify God because I know I can kill the body, but I can't kill the spirit. Hello now. See, the only part of Jesus you could kill was the body. The spirit within him was divine. And honey, you couldn't touch that. Hello now. I want to tell you something today. Knowing who Jesus is in truth is what is liberating. That is what liberates. You can't just know of Jesus or about Jesus. You've got to know Jesus himself. In John 14, verses 15 through 20, the word of God reads... If ye love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of, listen, truth. Well, now, wait a minute. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Even the Spirit of truth. Well, what spirit might that be? Might be the spirit of Jesus, huh? Might be the spirit of Christ. Listen, whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him. For he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Well, now, if the Holy Ghost is a separate person, then the Lord's saying, well, I've been here with you, you know. The Holy Ghost's been here, and you know him because he's, he's lived with you, but he's going to live in you. That's not what he was saying. Listen, he continues. He said, verse 18, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. We sing the song, the comforter has come, the comforter has come, right? Who do we call the comforter? The Holy Ghost. Who did Jesus say the comforter would be? He said, I will come to you. Hallelujah. He was talking, I, I, I hate to use this phraseology, but I think people understand it better. He was talking in effect in code, okay? But if you look at what he's saying and you put the pieces together, it's like, oh my goodness, I see what he's saying. He's saying when he leaves, something's going to come back that you won't be able to see with your naked eye, and it's going to do everything Jesus did. The only difference is it'll be invisible. It's going to live in us instead of with us. 
And the Lord said, I will come to you. So if the Holy Ghost is one separate person of the Trinity and Jesus is another separate person of the Trinity, hallelujah, we've got both Jesus and the Holy Ghost in the world. But the Bible said, for by one spirit are you all baptized into one body. Hello now. There's no such thing as the spirit of Christ and the spirit of God. That would be two different spirits. If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. That's what the Word of God said. That's what Paul said. The Spirit of Christ. The Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. Whatever you want to call it, honey, you're talking about invisible Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Let's continue. He said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Verse 19. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But ye... See me, because I live, ye shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. See, that code isn't too hard to break, is it? You put that together, it's pretty obvious what the Lord's saying. Hallelujah. In John chapter 15, verse 26, But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceeds from the Father, he shall testify of me. That literally means he will speak on my behalf or he will speak as me. That is why when you have tongues and interpretation, that is why when you have prophecy, it is thus saith the Lord. It ain't Mother Mary talking. It ain't the Apostle Paul talking. We're not channeling some spirit. No, we are literally being used of the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ. He will only speak in the first person. Do you follow what I'm saying? So the Holy Ghost speaks in the first person because the Holy Ghost is the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So you got to understand, people don't realize, the Lord was dealing with people who had a Jewish mindset. Okay? They, they, had, they had been raised in a Jewish mindset. Uh, teaching and according to Jewish teaching, the whole concept of God as a man was hard enough for them to get or to wrap their mind around. Okay? When the Lord's trying to describe to them, when I leave, I'm coming back. If he'd have said it that way, first of all, you'd have all kinds of people saying, oh, okay, so he's coming back physically. As soon as he leaves, he's coming back physically. So he'll be back real quick. We'll see him real quick. And he's trying to explain them, but you're not going to see me. I'm not going to be visible. I'm coming back, but I'm not going to be visible. But you're not going to be mourning my leaving because I'm coming back to you. I'm still going to be with you. I'm going to comfort you. You're going to be comforted by the fact that although you cannot see me, you know I'm there. And it's not a matter of knowing it up here. It's a matter of I'm going to put my spirit in you. And that marriage of your spirit and my spirit is going to cause you comfort knowing that I am with you. Hallelujah. Oh, my goodness. I'm trying to finish up today. I hope I'm doing all right on time. I forgot to look and see what time I started. I shouldn't do that. The question today is not what do you no, or, or excuse me, the question today is not what do you do or what do you not do. It is not what do you wear or what do you not wear. It is not uh, where do you not go and where do you go. The question today that requires the right answer is simply what do you know? And the answer is, listen carefully now, when God says what do you know? You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. When God says, what do you know? Your answer ought to be like this. Lord, it's not what I know, it's who I know. Hallelujah. It's not what I know, it's who I know. What do I know? I know Jesus is God. 
What do I know? God put on a robe of humanity so he could do something for me that no human being could ever possibly do. Hallelujah. What do I know? I know that Jesus condemned sin in the flesh so that I would not have to be subject to the penalty of sin if I would put my faith and trust in him. Hallelujah. What do I know? I know it's all about him. I know Jesus is the way. He's the truth and the life. Hallelujah. I know nobody can find you except coming through that man that bought planet earth that they called Jesus. That's what I know. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad today? You know, we sing that old song. I love that old song. I'm glad I know who Jesus is. I'm going to tell you, knowing who Jesus is makes all the difference in the world, folk. There are a lot of people in the Christian church today who profess him, and yet they don't know him. They know of him. They know about him. They have a concept of him, but they still don't fully know the truth. Because the truth is liberating. Lastly, today in 2 Timothy 1, 12 through 14, for the which cause, Paul writes, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. I know. He didn't say, I believe in him. He said, I know him. I know whom I have believed. I know Jesus. I know God is real. I know Jesus went to the cross. I know Jesus was buried. I know on the third day he rose. Hallelujah to God. There's a world of difference between saying I believe something and I know something. Hello now. You talk to a lot of Christians and they say, well, I believe thus and so. Oh, do you? You do, huh? You believe it? Then why did you say believe? Hello now. I don't know very many people come to me and say, well, according to Fox News, uh, <laughs> Hillary Clinton was running a prostitution ring for children out of the basement of a pizza parlor. And I believe it, bless God. No, usually they come to you. Do you know that Hillary Clinton was running? Do you know what I'm talking about? They come at you, Martin, like they know what they're talking about. Like it's established fact and only a pure demoron doesn't understand and get it. That's the way they come at you. Am I telling the truth? Amen. Even when people believe a lie, they'll come at you and say, Well, I know thus and so. You know that, huh? It ain't true, but you know it, huh? Do you follow what I'm saying? If you really believe something, then the word belief goes out of your lingo. It goes out of your vocabulary because faith ends in knowledge. You start out believing, but you end up knowing. Am I telling the truth? I believe God's a healer. I could stand up and say, I believe God's a healer. I don't believe God's a healer. I don't believe that for one minute. I know God's a healer. Whether he heals me or he doesn't heal me, I still know God's a healer. I've been healed so many times I can't even count. I have seen God perform miracles. I've seen people stand up out of wheelchairs who had legs and bodies bent up like pretzels. And I've literally watched their limbs straighten out and watched them stand up on their feet, Lisa. Don't tell me. You ain't going to tell me God ain't a healer. I know God's a healer. Do you hear what I'm telling you today? It's not about believing something. I love when Christians come, and I'm closing up. I love when Christians come to me and say, Well, I'm trying to believe God for a miracle. I'm trying to believe God for a healing. Really? Honey, if you go try it, and i got news for you, you've already failed. <laughs> if it takes any effort for you to touch God for that miracle, then I got news for you. you. You've fallen short already. Your faith isn't where it needs to be. You need to dig in the Word a little bit. You need to let the Word of God get in your spirit a little bit because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You get. I tell people who are struggling with sickness and illness and people in hospitals, go into your Bible and just read the New Testament. Read the Gospels. Read how Jesus healed this one and healed that one and healed. I said, I'm going to tell you something. You read that for a while and before too long, you're going to know that Jesus Jesus is a healer. Hallelujah. 
you're going to realize, hey, wait a minute. Everybody the Lord come into contact with. The Bible said he healed all manner of sickness and disease. It doesn't say he healed some and left others sick. It said he healed all manner of sickness and disease. Am I telling the truth? You see, the word of God is what feeds our faith. And if you're struggling to believe, then you need to get the word in there a little deeper. You need to get the word in there a little better. You need to get that word in you. Because the word of God, the Bible said, is not my word like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. Anything that is standing in your way, anything that would hinder you, God says, you want to overcome it? Put my word to work. You know Thor's hammer? Oh, now I got church folk having a fit that I'm referring to an old <laughs> Greek god, Roman god, whatever it is. You know that old, you know, Thor's hammer? Boy, I mean, he slams that thing down, everything crashes. That's the word of God, honey. God's word is like a hammer. You apply that word to anything standing in your way, and it'll smash it to pieces. Hallelujah. But then again, who's the word? Jesus is the word. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Hallelujah. So when you say the word word, you're talking about Jesus. When you say the word truth, you're talking about Jesus. Hallelujah. What do you know? I know Jesus. Amen. I know Jesus. And I know him in truth. And honey, that's all I need to know. Would you stand with me this afternoon?